Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan. Uh, I'm a postdoc uh, at Social Media Collective, Microsoft Research New England. It's just a basic research lab in the mold of like a Bell Labs or a Xerox Park. Um, I'm there for two years. While I'm there, I'm writing my first book and starting my second. Um, so thank you very much to Davis. Um, for arranging this visit to uh, Shannon Mattern, for making it happen in the first place, and for everyone in this room for what has been just an awesome, awesome event. Um, I did not know what I was getting myself into, and this has been a really, really excellent day. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, so full disclosure, I am not a librarian. Um, I'm a sociologist of labor and technology, but I study libraries as workplaces, and I, I care about them deeply as community spaces, and I feel that radical librarians have insights into the big issues of today that other folks miss precisely because of how much social action is in the library. Um, I'm also a new dad, so please blame any mistakes on the baby. Um, uh, Eliza, don't ignore that. Um, so I, I want to talk today about the, the core capitalist contradiction that characterizes libraries and institutions like them that care for the vulnerable and store and disseminate cultural knowledge. And this is building off of some remarks um, that you heard from Roxanne and Emily today very nicely. Um, so on the one hand, capital needs these institutions to care for and educate the populace. It requires a lot of work to transmit the skills and ideas that keep society functional and make workers productive. On the other hand, capital seeks to shed the dead weight um, of these institutions, which do not themselves produce profit, which demand a cut of others' profits through taxes and other means, and which provide working class communities of places to connect, renew, and resist. Institutional survival means navigating these contradictions. So I'm going to do some theoretical work explaining this contradiction, drawing on the work of Marxist feminists, doing what we call social reproduction theory, which we have already heard something about. Um, and then I'm going to explore how that contradiction plays out on the ground, drawing on three years of field work and interviews with librarians and homeless patrons in the Washington, D.C. public library system. Um, and finally, we'll talk about some strategic lessons for political organizing in libraries and the communities connected to them. And through all this, my job is not to take the scales from your eyes, because you guys are, after all, doing the work. Um, rather, I hope to offer some conceptual tools, some empirical observations that might clarify the struggles in which you're already engaged. Um, so as Mark said to his colleague Arnold Rouge about the relationship between political criticism and political organizing, we shall not say, abandon your struggles. They are mere folly. Let us provide you with true campaign slogans. Instead, we shall simply show the world why it is struggling. And consciousness of this is a thing it must acquire, whether it wishes or not. With that in mind, why do capitalists need libraries? So libraries improve workers' literacy and numeracy. These are important skills. Provide access to cultural resources that help immigrants Americanize or preserve keystone texts for the future to help future people Americanize. They provide access to health or government or technological resources. They provide shelter, the sort of thing that keeps potential workers alive. They provide disabled folks with te assistive technologies that allow them to go to work. They help directly or indirectly with childcare. These are really, really important things. And without them, the working class would be in much worse shape. And you've seen this before. <laughs> but these services and goods are generally free. And libraries, as public goods, generally are not required to turn a profit. That would seem very different from the capitalist factory, worlds away. But what I want to emphasize today is a view of the world from social reproduction theory, a body of Marxist feminist thought that evolved over the 20th century that emphasizes that there is only one economy connecting all of these spaces. So Marx identified one special unique commodity in capitalism, labor power, or people's ability to work. It's unique in that it is able to generate more value from capitalists' raw materials and machinery, and it is unique in that capitalists cannot make it for themselves. People don't come off the assembly line. Beyond this, Marx didn't have a ton to say. The core insight of social reproduction theory is that labor power, the ability to work, must be created, maintained, and reproduced outside the workplace from the scale of individuals to populations. As capitalism developed, this became the unpaid or underpaid work of women in the household. And in this way, love and care and food and sex are built into every other commodity, because these are the things that keep workers going. 
This reveals a whole terrain of social and economic conflict connected to but distinct from the factory. Fights over grocery bills or welfare rolls or the rent are fights with capitalist production just as much as factory strikes are. And this is not just individualized, but institutionalized in places like schools and hospitals and yes, libraries, places where the work is feminized in order to justify cheaping it. So for a brief timeline where I must emphasize that activism is theory, just as much as theory is, we see social reproduction theory taking shape in the early 20th century through feminist revolutionaries like Alexandra Kollontai, who showed that the form of the family changed as the form of capitalism changed. For her, economic revolution meant rebuilding the institution of the family as much as it meant rebuilding the factory. And we might think here about how the library of the information economy looks very much different from the library of the industrial economy. In the 30s and 40s, black feminist activists like Esther Cooper Jackson and Louise Thompson Patterson explored the specific exploitation of women of color, noting that the reproduction of the white working and middle classes often required the care work of women of color as maids, washwomen, etc. As in production, where workers of different races and nations are pitted against each other, whether continents away or on the same site, the terrain of social reproduction is uneven. And we can think here of the variegated distinctions between full and part-timers and libraries, between folks of the MLS and part-time techs or cleaners. In that same era and into the 60s, social reproduction theorists tied the struggle over the wage to struggles over life itself something that was hard to miss in, you know, for example, the Great Depression, when wages dried up just as everyone became dependent on them for food, for heat, for housing. Organizations like the CIO or the United Mine Workers built power through mutual aid and community associations, as well as strikes in the factory, which they coordinated alongside worker cooperatives for food and childcare. The state responded to this crisis by incorporating a lot of those demands and initiatives, as well as the project's private local charity, into the federal government. Social Security, AFDC, the WPA, you know, these are the things that keep the working class alive and healthy, but also tie them to the wage and to the state for survival and shut off outside options. We could perhaps think here about the post-war library construction surge in the same way, incorporating more and more human activity into these state institutions. It's an important resource, one that we should deserve to have, but is not always on our terms. As the economy crashed again in the 70s, we saw perhaps the high point up until now of social reproduction theory. Austerity hit, unemployment surged, welfare rights organizations led by black feminists fought against cuts to their payments, taking over municipal offices to demand more. And Marxist feminists demanded wages for housework, a demand intended to break the system because capitalism was impossible without the direct economic input of women's unpaid labor. Here we see the development of more systemic theory of the various social contracts enforced by the wage relation and how specific subjectivities, specific ways of working in the worlds are cultivated to support it. This helps us think about how and why it is that, as you guys know, 83% of librarians are women. How does that gendered labor market develop over time? Why does that appear natural? And in the last decade, social reproduction theory has seen a new resurgence. Conditions demanded it. Neoliberalism destroys the institutions of social reproduction that previous movements won, welfare reform being a particular example. And it grows the policing power that destroys working class communities and alternative means of subsistence, the war on drugs being a good example. Theorists today are particularly concerned with institutions, how pensions and schools and hospitals are integrated into capitalism. They're concerned with internationalism, so the global division of care, how babysitters and maids come from many continents away, and with intersectionality, integrating the conceptual work that black feminists have done into the big picture of capitalist social reproduction that has often gone on kind of in parallel. And again, I think the major value of social reproduction theory is its emphasis that there is only one economy, as differentiated as it may be, spread across spaces that may feel more or less like work and with types of work that may be more or less commodified themselves. Capital needs these spaces to produce the workforce, but it's also a drag on profits and a threat to the powerful. Because these are spaces where working people do not just survive, they're spaces where we build community. The institutionalization of these spaces is often a victory it ensures their survival for the long term. But in the process, working people often lose control of them. Now I want to show you how these contradictions play out on the ground. 
And here I shift into a less didactic, more narrative voice, um, drawing on three years of field work with one specific social reproductive institution, the DC Public Library System. In particular, its massive MLK Junior Central Branch and the fight over its computer labs in the lead up to its closure for renovation last year. So I'm interested in how financial and political pressure on the library forces it to reshape itself and reproduce patrons, not as citizens, but as technology entrepreneurs. This is, of course, an uneven process, and many of the materials introduced through it become resources for patrons, especially homeless folks, who desperately need the library and who reshape it according to their needs. The library continues to do amazing work for the community, but the new mission, this tech-focused mission, keeps it alive, it allows it to survive, and so that mission has to be protected at all costs. This subtitle is a quote from one of my librarians, Elena, explaining why she kicked people sleeping in the computer lab out of the library. So in 2004, there was a lot of talk in DC of radically downsizing the library system. That system had been dealt a very public eye and uh, black eye in March of that year when a virus took down every single computer in the system for an entire month. Today, library officials talk about that as a sort of like come to Jesus turnaround moment for the entire system when they realize just how high the stakes were. Ultimately, it was a symptom of austerity, surprise. In 1975, 620 full-time employees worked at 20 DC libraries, but in 2004, only 430 worked at 27 libraries. A Couple more libraries, a couple hundred fewer people. The library was, like most of DC public services, understaffed and underfunded, its funding reliably a much lower proportion of the municipal budget than peer cities. This was born of the budget cuts that Mayor Anthony Williams insisted on as part of his scheme to kind of get control of the city's finances back from Congress. And that may seem like a really weird political dynamic, but it's, it's just really an outsized manifestation of the city versus state conflict that is everywhere in the US, and which New York City is, of course, very familiar with. The library system then was short on political and financial support, and it was overwhelmed by a homelessness crisis that it was unequipped to handle. The month-long outage was just the most visible sign of these tensions. Fast forward to exactly 11 years later. In March of 2015, I was at the Martin Luther King Jr. Central Branch of the library system with Dave, the mid-30s white man at the head of MLK's digital programming. Sherry, a mid-40s black woman and upper-level administrator at MLK, and the Friends of the Library Charity Group, a group of middle and upper-class white retirees who the lobby the library on policy changes, run literacy classes, and book drives. Throughout a presentation on the library's upcoming renovation, our backs were to the glass cubicles separating the Dream Lab presentation space from the Digital Commons Computer Lab, whose 150 seats were full as usual and dominated by the city's homeless population. Mostly older black folks, more men than women, who walk over every single day if they're not dropped off by the shelter shuttles that also do pickup runs in the evening. Dave, eyes gleaming, asked if we'd like a tour of the new maker space upstairs. A reclaimed meeting room that was intended as a kind of proof of concept for the proposed renovation, funding for which was still being sought. So we walk past the librarian monitoring the th worrying 3D printer through the great hall where a mural of Dr. King overlooked local white internet entrepreneurs setting up hundreds of chairs for their monthly demo series, up two floors on the elevator, past one of the video visitation rooms for DC jail, around the corner from the Black Studies Center, back into the cavernous stairwell that had been a gay cruising spot for much of the 80s, through some locked double doors, and into a sunny meeting room whose floor to ceiling windows looked out onto a roof Chris Steakhouse. It was hard not to get caught up in Dave's hopeful gee wizardry as he showed off the 3D printers, the laser cutters, the CNC fabrication machine, and the scattered laptops. Dave pitched the maker skills that the Fab Lab would teach as a new literacy for a new economy, something that could help defeat the STEM gap and provide the creative technical workers he said were so desperately short on. Consumers would learn to maintain their devices and save the environment, and skilled techies would have a space to inspire underprivileged communities. One library friend pitched as a poetry lab to upgrade the arts for the 21st century. There was so much hope in that fab lab, much of it recycled from earlier pronouncements on the three-year-old computer lab that seemed so far away downstairs, where most patrons spent most of their time, and which was itself a massive upgrade from the 14 Dells that had previously made up the main computer lab of the central library branch of the nation's capital. There was so much pressure placed on those tools, on that room, on that library, and those librarians, even though now it's mostly used by library visitors, rather than the homeless folks who are there all day, every day. 
just like the Dream Lab startup space downstairs. The Fab Lab offered a reassuring vision of the future in a city where a flood of new tech workers post-recession has been accompanied by a housing crisis and a jobs crisis. A survey from the Council of Mayors last year noted that DC has the highest homelessness rate of any major metro area. According to the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, DC saw a 29% rise in the number of homeless families and a 12% rise in total homelessness since 2011, and an active policing policy that has 5% of the city in jail, on probation, or on parole. The top 10% of income earners in DC make six times the bottom 10%, the highest disparity of any state, because the middle fell out of the labor market during the recession. In a very real way, the digital library embodies a hope that these structural challenges can be overcome with the right tools and the right skills. Indeed, the institution is very literally rebuilt around this discourse of hope, this responsibility for local development. And what I want to talk about today is how that hope in digital skills and digital tools, both for existing entrepreneurs and for people on the margins of the information economy, is used to rebuild the library. This is a contradictory process because it preserves the institution while revising and in some ways reversing its role as a public space. This is a struggle over the library's role in the politics of social reproduction. DC public libraries produce this hope as a way of legitimating their existence in the internet era, proving they deserve to continue to exist, and as a way to manage their role as one of the last remaining safe public spaces for marginalized city residents. For the, librarian, for the library to maintain this hope in, quote, using the technology to improve lives, as Grant put it, it must necessarily regulate or eliminate other potential visions of the space. So how does this conflict over the purpose of the library manifest? So this is a joke that one of my librarians, April, regularly made with colleagues whenever she saw patrons engaged in self-talk, fighting with each other, eating, watching porn, touching themselves or a partner, or bedding down for the night on a strip of cardboard in the reference section. She gave out imaginary stickers as she walked the library to patrons whom she thought were using the space inappropriately, appropriately, or just wrong. And to me, this felt somewhat condescending, if not pathologizing, but it captures a really important conflict. April has a master's degree. She's a middle-class white woman who recently moved to the city for a secure but very stressful job. She could tell you how to verify Google results, do basic HTML, find your nearest polling station come election time. She loves open access. She very much misses President Obama. She's an ideal liberal knowledge worker, and her professional identity is formed by a series of confrontations with not that, with poor or working class patrons with only a high school diploma, if that. Much younger or much older black and Latino patrons who have been priced out of DC housing. Patrons with mental illness, patrons who mistake socialsecurity.com for socialsecurity.gov. These are her patrons, or customers, as she usually says. This mission of progressive outreach and its gendered, raced, and classed overtones have been with the profession, I don't need to tell you guys this, since at least the founding of the ALA in 1893. Uh, white middle class women in the progressive era, for example, worked as readers' advisors, teaching immigrant patrons to move away from entertainment materials and towards Anglo-American classics, inculcating sufficient literacy to enter the formal labor market and formal housing markets. Um, today, most of my librarians describe their profession in classed and gendered terms as a pink collar one, with April calling them, quote, maybe of knowledge. This mission took on a, a digital turn when the Clinton administration put the digital divide on the agenda, but also pushed the 1996 Telecommunications Act, which gave the US some of the slowest, most expensive internet in the free world, and made libraries pretty much the only place you can get it for free. More generally, beyond the internet, how many places are left in our cities where you can spend all day in a comfortable public place without buying anything, have a wealth of learning opportunities at your fingertips, and receive free guidance from people with advanced degrees? Library is pretty much it. And more than that, you know, MLK offered ACA signups, flu shots, dance lessons, Spanish conversation partners, a rich archive of DC history, and much, much, much more. But it was also decades overdue for renovation, and those, those present needs for a public space conflicted with the library's needs for a space that was oriented towards that hopeful future of tech work. And this conflict was, was built into the library, into its computing, into the rules for computing, and to how you selected and trained library personnel. So there's a lot you can do with a PC, obviously. But at the library, it's largely directed towards the professional norms of white collar knowledge work. For example, the librarian teaching an intro to PC basics emphasized both the skills of how to write and left click, create folders, but also concepts. 
the different names for a flash drive, how deletion works, the quote proper language of the industry that would prevent people from being um, embarrassed at a job interview. She constantly used the civil service exam as a reference point, even if most of her students were not applying for those mid-level bureaucratic jobs. Those values are also built into the lab's login system. Patrons use their library card to sign up for a session at a central terminal and are then directed to a queue that is displayed on a large screen mounted on the wall. So there were 70 PCs in that three-year-old digital commons lab um, in 2012, three years before that. Elena, um, who had supervised the three-hour waits for a dozen computers in the old popular services lab, had told me that even triple the number of computers wouldn't be enough. And she was right. Um, especially in the DC sweltering summers when, unlike winter, there is no right to shelter for the homeless and there can still be an hour wait for a PC. The Pharos login system not only managed the queue, it allowed librarians to monitor every session's activity from a central terminal and choose to end or extend the session. Patrons watching porn repeatedly might find a pop-up screen saying, please don't do that. They're not using the library right. On the other hand, Patrons working on a job application might ask the central desk for extra time and have it tacked on. Staffing decisions were also key. So choosing the correct librarian chooses the correct way of using the library. This is, on the one hand, a long-term issue of the librarian pipeline. So a lot of the veteran librarians I interviewed really regretted the transformation of library schools into iSchools. And we see Becca's reading of the shift here while she was getting her MLS in 2000 as the kind of like tragic downfall of the profession, um, the embrace of technical over service values. And she was probably the most junior librarian I knew who still called her patrons patrons instead of customers. And then there's a further filtering in local hiring of librarians. So as Eugene, a mid-20s white librarian, explained here, the Digital Commons is 70 computers, it's Adobe Creative Suites, it's 3D printer, it's book printer, as well as the Dream Lab's glass-enclosed conference rooms that they loaned out to local startups. All of this was incomplete without a group of librarians who were younger, hipper, whiter, and more tech-savvy than the branch's majority black veterans. Their enthusiastic startup aesthetic was really essential to the place. Eugene called them the hipster contingent. They performed the hope that linked personal computing with knowledge work and social mobility. They were the source of a lot of debate in the librarians' union um, because a large number of veteran black librarians were bought out of their contracts right before the hipster contingent was hired and the digital commons opened. Um, but this story is very obviously incomplete. So while the library has a specific organizational kind of top-down form for what it wants things to look like, you know, it's very individualized into long rows of PCs or desks with plugs. It's very transparent um, with glass cubicles and open air. It's surveilled to orient <laughs> patrons towards the habits and methods of office work. Um, but we, what we might understand is that powerful downward pressure is always, to a greater or lesser degree, resisted and reconfigured by people within it. Patrons have agency. So first, I want to talk about how homeless patrons, the vast majority of regular library users at MLK, adapted to the institution's production of space. And then I want to explore how they crafted new places for themselves within it. So patrons are well aware that librarians are happy to help fill out social service forms for food stamps, affordable housing, et cetera. And they pick particular librarians who have good reputations for this thing or that thing. Most patrons also acknowledge that something like porn is doing the library wrong. Most of it is filtered after all, but that they could get away with it with a little work. You know, you choose the right site, you switch between windows, you nonetheless keep hardcore porn open in a wide open room with 150 other people in it. And that takes a lot of skill, we should recognize. <laughs> it's also a tacit recognition of an unresolved kind of ideological conflict that was within most of the librarians at MLK. So as Rachel explained here, librarians really wanted to preserve the library's traditional orientation towards the kind of free flow of information, particularly for people without other means of access. Um, really? Yeah, all right. Let me go a little bit over that. Um, but they also want to preserve the hopeful future orientation towards knowledge work. You wouldn't watch porn at the office. This conflict extends to other areas, but porn is really the first example of doing the library wrong that every participant jumped to, just as job apps were the first example of doing the library right. There was a similar pattern in patron interactions with the police who kind of roamed the library uh, branches hand on their pistol, five or six on duty at a time in MLK. Their walkie-talkie, the loudest thing in a quiet room. They had a control room upstairs to review their camera network, and they were allowed to touch patrons where librarians were not. And they tended to enforce norms for sleeping, drugs, fights, phones, theft, exposure, 
rather than computer use unless a librarian calls them in to act as the kind of conservative right hand that sternly enforces the liberal left hand's rules. Um, so I spent much of my three years with uh, Mia, Ebony, Josie, and Terrell, um, part of a crew of just incredibly generous, welcoming uh, homeless black youth. And we were mostly in digital commons. We also took some classes together. We stood in line for the bus, for charity food, text each other. And any day that these guys weren't at a day program for a clinic or at a visit with social services, which is often because being poor is a very expensive, time-consuming way to live, um, they were at the library. But they only ended up at MLK in early 2014 because they had moved from branch to branch, kind of fleeing cops who had hassled them for sleeping at a desk or speaking too loud on the phone. Finally, patrons adapted not just to people, but to machines. They had a whole slew of strategies to get around this login system. So Mia, before she got a used laptop, would email whatever she was working on to herself before her session ended, run back and grab Josie's library card, uh, and then start a new session as soon as possible. So she told me it wasn't like you could complete something like a housing application in an hour anyway, even if you got another 15 minutes tacked on. This parallels how folks kind of share other state-issued ID cards outside the library, food stamps cards, clinic-issued metro passes, that kind of thing. But patrons don't just adapt, they also create. Some of these creations had to be suppressed. Others could be incorporated into the library's kind of future vision of itself. So there's a lot of play places in the digital commons. What my field notes always called noisy corner was a group of tables and chairs with no PCs. And for 2013 and much of 2014, it was, especially after school let out, taken up by loud card games, mostly Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. Friends met there every day, cheered each other on like any other sporting event. But that's not using the library right, because you wouldn't do that at the office. So one of the new librarians, Jeffrey, Mohawk, mechanics overalls, invited a friend of his who lives in a suburb outside the city to drive in on weekends and organize official leagues with jackets and badges and tournaments. And they used the kind of glassed in startup space that was occupied by businesses during the week. Problem solved. There was a lot of collaboration here too, even as personal computing in the digital commons is designed as a fairly kind of solitary experience. Long rolls of Dells all facing the same direction, like a lecture hall. Collaboration was obviously cool in the kind of glass cubicles in the back where the startups worked, but there was plenty of non-digital entrepreneurship among patrons. Um, drug sales, so usually synthetic weed or crack cocaine, which the police cracked down on quite hard. Um, there's a crew of these like Craigslist pyramid schemer guys who are always on their phones, their PCs. Um, there are oil men, black Muslim men with little vials of fragrance either on their um, belts or in little wooden chests that they carry around, um, working together to kind of map the best neighborhoods for sales. Cops mostly left them alone. Vibrant repairs culture where people kind of trade peripherals or give each other tips for speeding up that used laptop or downloading anime. Everyone went to Mia for this. She was like the grand dam. But also non-digital work, like how to fill out social service forms for maximum benefits or who to go see at which office. But probably the most important use of the library space, especially for the homeless community, remember, last truly public space in the city, was as a place for rest a place to check email between dishwasher shifts, to stop after your day program because most, sh most shelters kick you out during the day, to sit and rest, and yes, sleep. Because it's 100 degrees out in our swampy summer, and neither shelter beds nor the sewer grates above the subway stop next to MLK are quiet, comfortable spaces at night, and because many psych meds are really strong sedatives. And while, similar to the porn issue, librarians are really conflicted on this, the fact is you can't sleep at your PC at the office, so you can't sleep in the computer lab. So they patrolled, knocking on the decks, desks of nappers, calling in the police if they didn't respond. So we've seen that this hope for the future of the library as a kind of digital skills center is not naturally occurring. It has to be produced and reproduced every single day. And that involves the regulation of emergent places that kind of diverge from that plan. It is literally rebuilt to become, as the slogan goes, a new transformative space rather than the old transactional one. We got that from uh, Richard Reyes Gavion, who some of you guys may know from the Brooklyn uh, Public Library System. This three-year, $208 million renovation project required, as Grant tells me um, in 2014, admitting that the contemporary computer lab failed and that it needs to be taken apart and put back together. So the homeless patrons watching YouTube or dozing off in the back did not fit the hope of the digital commons or the fab lab upstairs. And so those rest places, collaboration places, those play places that patrons built, <coughs> excuse me, 
will be physically segregated from the startup workspaces, the seminar spaces, and the transformative technologies that will form the heart of the new library. At MLK, we saw that these contradictions over social reproduction, saving a space to produce a new workforce, disciplining or destroying a space because it's too expensive or produce the wrong kind of people, play out again and again. The digital skills focus made the overwhelming problem of homelessness much easier to manage. You know who to kick out of the library and who to let in, and it provided a path to legitimacy when it was under threat. This was an uneasy process because this vision of how the world works come into the conflict with the library's historic sense of purpose, as well as patrons' own agency to reshape the, reshape the space. Indeed, while librarians were happy with securing the much needed long overdue renovation, they were really upset with how those prototype features played out. And they were especially distraught at how the city government seemed to have no plan for the homeless patrons who would lose that community space while it was under construction. Hundreds of people redirected to a day center in an industrial park in the city's edge, like a half hour away. Plans for a downtown day center never came together. Librarians really hustled to get resource pamphlets together for patrons as the closing date approached, but it was hard to kind of overcome those divisions that were literally built into the library in the lead up to the renovation. There was a trust gap. Homeless patrons and the friends of the library staged a protest day at the end of the closure. I'm, I gotta go a little over. But it was clear the city government had rolled right over them. This story raises a lot of questions about the library as a site of social reproduction. So how do library services relate to housing costs? How is the labor of face-to-face -face service, functionally social work, distributed throughout the SAF? Most important one for the audience today is this. How can we build and maintain libraries on the terms of the workers who staff them and the communities who use them, knowing full well that there's a lot of divisions in both those groups? We saw that the library renovation was a win for administrators and a loss for homeless people, and that this conflict briefly forged a political alliance between library workers, community activists, and homeless patrons. Traditionally, we think of workplace struggle as internal conflicts over money and the pace and quality of work, but as this picture from 1968 Contra Costa Library and Strike shows, those who work in social reproduction necessarily make demands that impact people outside their institution. Strategically then, we have to think about how to build our institutions, manage our labor, craft demands, and make social networks that leverage these extra institutional connections in a way that unites the power of library workers with that of the community outside the library. In the labor movement, we call this social justice unionism, and it refers to unions whose activism links their working conditions with the broader life of the community, in particular to ensure that when workers strike, they have the overwhelming support of their constituents behind them. The Chicago Teachers Union is perhaps the best example of that philosophy currently active today. So after the radical core caucus won leadership elections in 2010, they turned the union towards actively organizing existing members in the community, creating a whole organizing department that built reading groups, knocked on doors, held cookouts, and liaised with other powerful groups in sectors like transportation. This ensured that when they struck over contract negotiations in 2012, working class Chicago understood that teachers' working conditions were students' learning conditions, and they were striking for the city against the 1% who were shutting down schools, growing classrooms, and replacing veteran teachers with TFA scabs. Management lost their best talking point, that greedy unions were hurting kids. Rahm Emanuel continued his assault after this, closing more schools, and the conflict peaked again in 2016. The contract that came out of that didn't just preserve pensions and raises, but diverted some of the city's real estate development fund for schools, which is absurd. That never happens. It was not a perfect contract. They are never perfect contracts. But it was still a remarkable victory. Our own Emily Drabinsky, here in this room, helped lead the fight against Long Island University's austerity-minded management when, in the midst of contract negotiations, they locked out teachers and librarians brought in scabs. She writes in an organizer's tale, which obviously you should all read, about three core lessons she got from this. So one, find out who's on your side, where they stand and what matters to you. Two, find out who your leaders are. Three, talk with each other constantly to develop your analysis. She helpfully notes the divisions among workers here, part-time and permanent. And we might think of other divisions, too, in retirement packages or labor tasks, like archives versus patron services. And with the preceding talk of social reproduction in mind, I would add two quick additions. One, conflict is always ongoing. It's not just at the strike. Leaning into that conflict helps clarify who is on which side. Our spaces are riven with these contradictions and conflicts over our purpose, our membership, and our resources. They don't go away when we don't talk about them, but talking about them helps us see how they impact strategy. 
Some of MLK's librarians mentioned to me, for example, that their parent union also included local prison guards whose interests are directly opposed to them. This is a long-term problem that changes their relationship to Ask Me. Two, everyone is potentially valuable, but not unless they're organized. So always be focused on activating your constituency inside and outside of the workplace. Be growing that base of like-minded people, workers, neighbors, patrons, community members. MLK's workers and patrons realized these connections, but they were too late. They were able to mobilize some crowds and petitions. They were not able to organize the sort of resistance that would scare the government. That takes a lot of time. What might that look like? We might repeat the work of teachers unions and hold budget teach-ins, showing patrons how the city uses its money and how it impacts the library, the schools, or the park. Homeless patrons often confront these municipal offices directly, and so they bring with them an incredible critical literacy about how these bureaucracies work. It's an amazing resource. These are just a few notes on how libraries fit into this contradictory landscape of capitalist social reproduction. I hope my quick tour of this theory and my observations on the conflict over library space in DC did a little bit to clarify and concretize the struggles that everyone in this room is already engaged in, whether you know it or not. The real work is still to be done, and I'm excited to talk with you guys further about it. Thank you. Right, give me a wave if you have a question. A comment. So when does this book come out? And is it about this, this research you did, this field work? This is a chapter. Um, and uh, the book is due at the end of the year. At earliest case scenario, that it'll be out end of next year. Um, I, if you guys want to read this specific chapter, it's published in the conference proceedings in the 2016 I conference. Yeah. Um, so that's just up on my website. You can go grab it from there. It's just a quick question. I have a loud voice. I just wondered how you came on your topic, your research topic, because when I was an academic librarian, and when somebody was interested in a topic, I'd say, how did you come to this topic? So. Uh, um, so I was a social worker for a while before grad school doing reentry, um, so helping folks who were in prison or mental hospitals um, get housing and work in the community. And we noticed that a lot of our digital literacy lessons kind of reversed the um, horizontal relationship that, that we otherwise had with our clients, where we were where we were used to be colleagues. Now it was very much student teacher. It was totally didactic. Um, we also noticed that a lot of digital initiatives that we were hoping was we would succeed with failed miserably and ended up alienating our con um, clients. So I got really interested in why um, people pursue digital divide solutions even when they don't work. And in general, in all of my work, I'm really interested in why good institutions do bad things. Like when you, institutions are made of people, but they're really complicated, crazy beasts. And from conception to execution, a whole bunch of things happen. So this is really a book about how like the learn to code um, stuff really seeps into all of our public institutions. So libraries are one place where I explore that. I often look at a kind of STEM-focused charter school. Um, and some civic-minded startups. The book is kind of written as a story of DC as a whole and how these ideas start to take over all these institutions and how money and ideas and technology moves from startups who you know, start to take over school boards um, to libraries who teach kids after school when they don't have a chance to do their homework at home because they don't have computer access. Um, so I'm trying to do anthropology of a whole city rather than one particular institution. Did you ever ask anyone uh, why they preferred to call their patrons or readers or whatever customers versus something else? Their boss told them. Um, yeah, so either their boss told them, or for some people it was like uh, kind of a hidden curriculum in grad school where like it was never an explicit instruction. A lot of these instructions are never explicit. It just happens over and over again and eventually you pick it up. Um, but for some people, um, they had had experiences with supervisors where they told them. Uh, 
did the librarians ever kind of push back uh, against like the heavy police presence or you said that the, the police presence was kind of like the right hand, uh, the, yeah, the right hand that the left used to enforce rules. I was going to throw the neoliberalism word in there, but you know, imagine it. I, I think it's really important that we not just talk about neoliberalism as the everything turning into markets and profit, and like everything melting into air, and we're all like walking dollar signs anymore. There's a lot of violence involved. There's a lot of, I mean, come on, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> like, let's be serious. Like, there's a lot of cops out there. There's a massive prison boom. Um, so it's always really, really important to talk about how um, the. Uh, not everyone wants to get turned into an entrepreneur. And sometimes you need to force them to do that. Um, as for that specific question of um, how librarians related to cops, they weren't happy about it. And some people would not call the cops, which is great advice in general. Don't call the cops. But. Um, they were, I, I cannot emphasize enough how overwhelmed staff were at MLK. It, it is effectively, was effectively, um, the city's largest day shelter. Um, and as we saw with Becca's quote about losing human values, a lot of folks felt they were not trained at all for what was functionally social work. They had a lot of technical skills and they were very proud of. They did not know how to deal with people that were decompressing or, um, because they didn't have their meds. And they may not want to call the cops in that scenario, but they didn't have anyone else to call. We are at time. So thank you so much, Dan. And I'm going to turn the mic back over to Davis. Thank you. Just a quick note. There's beer and snacks. So if you feel like decompressing, please have at it. Thank you very much.